You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hi, I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's largest mortgage lender. Spring will be here soon, so if buying a new home is on your to-do list, right now is the time to call Quicken Loans. Learn about which mortgage options make sense for you and get a jump on your competition. With our exclusive rate shield approval, the low rate you lock today is protected for up to 90 days while you shop for your new home. With a rate shield approval, if rates go up, your low rate stays locked. But if rates go down, you get that new, even lower rate. Either way, you win. Talk to us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com to take advantage. Here's another great reason to work with us. For a record nine years in a row, J.D. Power has ranked Quicken Loans highest in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. Again, to lock in today's low mortgage interest rate and get the security of our exclusive rate shield approval, call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. For J.D. Power award information, visit jdpower.com. Rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Sesame Ginger Glaze Chicken Signature Wrap. How would you like it? I'll take a... Sports announcer at home? Yeah, how'd you... We just know. My wife picks up the new signature wrap. It's got double the rotisserie style chicken mixed with a sesame ginger glaze. She appears annoyed at me, but she shrugs it off. Those sweet and savory flavors are calling her name. She lifts the wrap and she takes the bite. Incredible. And now she's closing the door on my subway. Make it what you want. Limited time only at participating restaurants. Double meat based on average six inch sub. I'm little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. No, that like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and pour me out. (laughs) This is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. It's the refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. I'm Alan Ray. And I do this for free. Here I am. It is a refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. I am your refreshingly humble host. And I do this for free. Yep, nope, not a dime paid. I'm broke. But that's all right. That's all right. I got my I got my knees wrapped, both knees wrapped. I have my recovery drink. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. It's been quite the week. I've lost my mind, obviously. Obviously, I have gone completely mental, bat crap crazy. We will discuss in just a moment. I'll be right back.
so a little over a week ago, I'm uh, I'm at work during break, kind of cruising through uh, my my work emails, which my work email has you know ninety eight percent work, about two percent other stuff, you know. Yeah, I, I, that work that email is with me. Um, it, it's mine. Okay. And even though it's my job, you know, email, it's, it's my email. Uh, the, the, where I work just says, yeah, this is going to be yours. You're, you're, you know, branded, marked for life. So that's cool. But, it, <laughs> but, um, two years ago, I ran the Dexter Ann Arbor half marathon. My first half marathon ever. Okay. Last year, I just, oh, didn't feel the whole running thing. I ran a little bit, did a couple of 5Ks, didn't do bad, Meh, well, you know, I just, just wasn't feeling it. And and when everything started kind of going to heck this year, um, I, I you know, here's the thing. And, and, and let me chase a rabbit here and set this all up. I, I, I mentioned on this show that uh, during this COVID pandemic and... In, in spite of the of what you're hearing in the panic news, uh, it is tapering off. It is coming to an end. Do the research yourself. Look at the numbers yourself. Even though people are still catching it, even though people are still getting sick, there's not masses of people dying from it. The death rate is much, 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 much lower than heart disease. Do that homework yourself. But I digress. Um I started thinking to myself, okay, I only took a couple of weeks off. Those two weeks were cold, nasty, kind of rainy, miserable. I didn't run. Uh, I did start getting myself back, you know, to work, back into the groove, back doing things. And the more my life straightened out and the more normal I felt, the more I started running, working out. And I made up my mind. I was like, you know what? Uh, there was a virtual 5K coming up. Uh, it's one that I run, the usual 5K I run every year because they're good friends of mine whose son died uh, from a drunk driver crossing a median on a, on a freeway and killed him and another young man and injured another young lady who I'm also friends with her family. I've watched these kids grow up. It was heart-wrenching. And so I run this 5K because it's a a scholarship donation for the scholarship uh, that they put on in honor of their son. They made a positive out of a negative, and who am I not to participate in that? So that was coming up. I said, okay, I'm going to run it. I ran it. You know, we donated the money. I ran it. And uh, it's, it's, you know, those of you who are not runners who don't know anything about running, a 5K is a little over three miles. It's 3.125 miles, okay? I am fortunate out here in the cornfields of southeastern Michigan in Gadsden Studios, where I broadcast from, I am fortunate enough to have several paths marked out. Now, I've been running pretty much, man, almost 10 years now. And um, when you do that, you you when you are running, you get to the point where you know what's three miles, you know what's what... So anyways, so last week, I'm sitting there going, there's the Dexter Ann Arbor 5K. Man, that was fun to run. And I'm looking at it, and it says it's gone virtual. And you can tell they're kind of hurting for people to sign up because they dropped the price a little bit, and they said, you know, we're going to do this virtually, and you know, whatever. And I looked at the date, and I looked at the calendar, and I went, I wonder if I could get in half marathon shape in one month. Now I'm not in bad shape right now. I've been running, you know, three and a half miles almost every day uh, for the last couple of weeks. So last Saturday, I woke up in the morning. I said, you know what? I've been running three and a half miles. Today, I'm going to step out the door and run five. And I did. It was in the rain. It hadn't rained in weeks, weeks, And, of course, you know, I woke up, and it was raining, and I said, I'm still going to run. In fact, in fact, it was one of those nice little soaking rains. I threw contact lenses in, and I took off, and it was a blast. I love running in the rain. I love running in the snow. Snow runs are some of my favorite things. Um, But I, I did the five miles, and throughout the week, I have run 
20 miles. Now, I was running right around 10, 10, 11 miles a week. This week, I've run 20 miles. I've doubled my miles for the week. Now, it's going to be a challenge. I love a challenge. In fact, I was told by a good friend, a former coworker of mine, he, he basically pointed it out to me. He said, Al, you have warrior blood. You are not happy unless you are on some kind of a crusade, whether it be musical, whether it be running, whether it be, you know, setting up a warehouse, uh, acquisition of a new new place, something. So you have to be challenged. You have to have some kind of a crusade. He goes, that is the, that is the crusade blood in you coming out. And, you know, he told me this several years ago, and I stopped and I went, you know what? He's exactly right. I am staring down the barrel of 55 years old, okay? And I'm thinking to myself, can I do it? I mean, 10 years ago, mm, yeah, I wouldn't even thought twice. But here I am staring down the barrel, and this this uh, half marathon is two days before my 55th birthday. And I am bound and determined to run it. I've already got the map. I mean, it's it, it's easy for me to map it out because I've told you before, I mentioned on the show before, I, there's a trail that I run. And if you run that trail from beginning to end and turn around and run back, that's almost exactly a half marathon. And that's what I'm going to run. Um, I'm not going to be stupid this time. I'm actually going to run it uphill going out and downhill coming back because, hey, cheating. But <laughs> but anyways, um, the last half marathon I ran, it, it was a couple of months away, and I still did it. But I, I started looking back on my records, and yeah, about 40 days after I started training, I was in shape. I was running 10, 11 miles, and I was like, okay. So I'm betting, I'm hedging the point that I'm going to be able to do this in 30 days. In fact, it's almost exactly 30 days. Uh, it is the, the day I'm going to run it will be on Labor Day, which is September 7th, two days before my 55th birthday. So it's going to be a challenge. Now, I get asked all the time. And I don't want to bore you with with this type of stuff. I really don't. But what I want to do is 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 there's there's a reason I'm pointing this out to you. I get asked all the time, how do you do that? How how do you get up, get out the door, run those miles, uh end up running 13, you know, half marathons a little over 13 miles. And my response is always the same. Once your body is in reasonably good shape, it's all in your head. It's in your mind. And I've, I've talked about this on several shows, um, the, the difference in, in panic situations, the difference in emergencies between being an asset and being a liability. It's the asset mindset. It is the survival mindset that I'm not going to give up. Or as a friend of mine on Twitter and I <laughs> said last week, you know, you do not stop unless you're dying or puking. And I was laughing about that the last mile, you know, coming back to the house today because I was ready to die and puke. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't really pushing it. I call it my old man lope. I'm not near as fast as I used to be. I don't have a reason to be as fast as I used to be. That's the beauty about running these races. Run your own pace. Run your own pace. If you're out there doing this, if you're out there running, even if you're out there running three miles, you're doing something that 95% of the na nation's population is not doing. Now, running is kind of, I don't know about your area, but in my area, people run all the time. I mean, it, it just seems to be that, you know, more and more people are getting into shape. So I imagine that maybe you're down to maybe you're, you know, in the top 10% of being in shape. But... It does take determination. It does take stubborn practice, determination uh, to not get injured while running. And there's a lot of things that can get injured, your knees, your hips. I've already got a bad knee to begin with. So that's why I, uh, I, I wrap my knees. When I get done with anything over three miles, three miles, I can step out the door, do no problem. It's just a little workout. Five miles starts getting a little rough. Now, this weekend, I'll run six, maybe six and a half miles. But when you start running those kind of distances, especially when you're my age, all of your war wounds show up. 
you know, the, the time you screwed up your knee in basketball, the time you hurt your hip jumping off of a barn roof or something like that, all of that stuff starts to matter. And so you have to take care of yourself. You have to, you have to really focus on nutrition. I mean, super focus on nutrition. When you're burning through this many calories, you want to replace that calorie count with good, nutritious, wholesome food. And what that does, folks, is that brings all kinds of energy into your body. I can't even describe how good I feel right now, right now. I just, just walked in. Before I started uh, hitting this podcast, I walked through the door. I got myself a cool-down drink. I cooled off a little bit, jumped in the shower, took a really good shower, and and got back out, grabbed myself a little snack, a little uh, carbohydrate load of of whole oatmeal, you know, like a almost some kind of an oatmeal uh, snack. And I'm drinking a recovery drink. I've got a recovery drink to replace the electrolytes. I can't tell you how good I feel right now. I've got all kinds of energy because it it takes burning this kind of energy to create more energy. It, it's almost like a, a cyclical thing. It's almost like a dog chasing its tail. The more you run, the more you do things like this, the more energy you have to do things like this and the more you run. And then you start thinking to yourself, how, why do I quit? Why do I Why do I take breaks? I need to just keep this kind of shape all the time. Not to mention the fact that your weight drops really well and you can eat a lot more calories. When you're running five miles uh, a day, you're burning a meal worth of calories off. And if you if you know how to play the game right, you know how to eat right, you know how to eat nutritious food that doesn't really weigh you down, you can eat quite a bit and never gain a pound. In fact, you lose. I've, uh, I'm already down two and a half pounds just in the one week of going at it full tilt. So what I want to tell you is, the reason I'm saying this is get out there, and you don't have to be crazy like me. You don't have to be crazy like me, but get out there, walk, run. Yeah, people see these 5Ks, and a lot of them are for a really good cause, really good cause. A lot of them for, for to help people who have had cancer, help families uh, survive. Uh, I, I've got two of them that I do. One of them's for a women's shelter in Ann Arbor, and one of them's for a uh, an adoption um, thing. Up in uh, up in the upper part of Michigan, that my sister and my niece were involved in. They, they're foster parents, and this is a, like a foster, you know, children's house. And and I I donate my money to them, and I run for them. The five k or the uh, half marathon I'm training for right now it goes to several good causes. Your money gets doled out to some really good research projects, you know, medical research, and to help veterans and things like that. You know, look around and you don't necessarily have to run them. When you go to these things, they're the most supportive. You know, the runners are the most supportive people I've ever run across. No pun intended. <laughs> but when you go to these things, there's people there who, you know, they they fire off the, the beginning gun and they're already halfway through the race by the time you reach the starting point. Um there's other people there like me who's who are there just because it's fun. They like the atmosphere and they do the five k. They're running. Yeah, I try to I try to improve on my runs all the time. I try to beat the last time I run, but I know I'm not going to win first place. Um, and then there's people who go there. Mothers who have kids in strollers. Um, older women who like to walk and gossip. <laughs> <laughs> I see it all the time, you know, and they all just walk, you know, straggle behind you. And they do, they, they're three and a 3.125 miles walking and they feel good. They're doing something for themselves. So I encourage you to do it. But let me get back to what I was saying. The, people ask me all the time, how do you run this kind of distance? And I tell them it's your mindset. It is your, it, it's, once you get it in your mind, I can do this. You can do it. I have no doubt with enough training, enough time, which I don't really have the time to do it right. You know, I just, I don't have the time. And I really don't have the desire to run a whole marathon, 26 miles. I could probably do it. I don't want to. Uh, the half marathon beats me up. You know, running 12, 13 miles, I'm done for the day. When I get done doing that, I'm done. I, there's nothing else I want to do. I go home and it's just like, I'm done. My body says, okay, time to recover. You know, I don't know. Maybe if I would have started when I was 30, 
But the thing about it is, is it's in your mind. It's the same mentality. It's the same psychology that helps people survive emergencies, helps people survive in bad situations. You know, um, we're watching things going on this week. We had that explosion in Beirut. Now, it's coming out now that that was like 2,750 tons, tons of ammonium nitrate. Okay, now if you remember right, ammonium nitrate was the same thing that was used in the Oklahoma City bombing. And that was just like a half a truckload, and it blew the whole face off that building. This was 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate. And it blew. And it it shattered windows. Right now, uh, Beirut is in bad shape. There's people who are going to have to survive for the next few weeks until things get back under control, until they figure out a way to get their life back to normal. Uh, and the difference between becoming a liability, having to depend 100% on the state, or becoming an asset – helping others, being able to survive on your own and and be an asset to others, helping organize, you know, parties to search out people who are lost, maybe buried in a wreckage. The difference is a lot of it is in your head, that same survival mindset as it takes to step out onto the pavement and say, I am going to run from this city to that city, and then I'm going to turn around and run back. You have it in your mind. And and during that run, I can tell you, during when you run that far, there's times where you go, I can't do this. I got to stop. I can't do this. I got to stop. And what you got to do is you got to put that little voice in your head, like I just said, no stopping. You do not stop unless you are puking or dying. And maybe even then you still need to run. Yeah. <laughs> you have to put that voice in your head, that commanding drill sergeant voice. And it's kind of funny because I run with an app called Run Keeper. And it actually has a drill sergeant voice in it. And, and I, I, sometimes I turn that on because it's funny. You know, he's like, oh, you're the best maggot on the block. Get running. I don't make you cookies. I look like your mama. You know, it reads off your time and your pace and everything. And then it makes some kind of comment. And I, I turn that on a lot when I'm training because it's, it's just got that voice. It says, you need to keep going. And that is the survival mindset that I have been talking about. And it's kind of funny. Now, I made I mentioned the fact that I'm going to be 55 when you know two days after I run this half marathon, I'm going to be 55. And if you're, you know, the space nerd like me, oh, nerd alert, nerd alert, we had a nerd alert. Okay, we've been watching um, Dragon X. We've been watching the space program. We watched uh, Bob Binkin and Doug Hurley launch into space. Uh, they've been up there, and then they came down over the last weekend. And they had a good splash down. Everything went smooth as silk. And I know uh, that Jeff is going to hit more of this on In the Crease, and, and he'll hit more of it on Lost Wanderer. And But I wanted to put my two cents in. I was looking at this, and, and I was reading an article about how they were saying, you know, going through the atmosphere. That's the hardest part. The hardest part about space flight from what I've read and what I've, you know, seen and heard interviews, the hardest part is coming down because you have to go through that atmosphere, and it's just brutal. You know, it, it, your, your, your spaceship heats up to unimaginable temperatures, you know, and uh, they were talking about how it was jarring. You know, it wasn't like they were inside of a spaceship. It was like they were inside of a wild animal. And coming through the atmosphere, you know, the first set of shoots that slowed them down to 350 miles an hour was like getting hit in the back with a baseball bat. You know, and then they, they, I noticed something that I'd never noticed before, that uh, Bob Bacon is 50 years old. Doug Hurley is 53. They're my age. Does that mean I can go to space? I want to go to space. I want to do it. I want to do the thing. Let me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But anyways, <laughs> you have to understand that atmospheric friction, uh, when, when you're going through the atmosphere and plunging back to Earth, uh, the, the heat shield of the Crew Dragon heated up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,927 Celsius. Isn't that crazy? That's scorching. That is a lot of heat. Um, and 
you have to slow the rate of descent down to 350 miles an hour, which 350 miles an hour is pretty fast. But they called it a flawless mission. I mean, they were excited about it. And minutes later, when they splashed down, um, that went well. The second set of parachutes opened up. They hit. Boom. And what do they do when they hit? Well, they make prank phone calls to whoever they could get a hold of. But there was a reason, and if you read this, there was a reason they were making prank phone calls. They had a satellite phone, and they were just making prank phone calls to people they knew, you know, and stuff like that. There was a real reason for it. In all seriousness, they needed to prove that they could contact Mission Control using a satellite phone in case the crew landed in an unexpected part of the ocean and needed to get picked up so they wouldn't be lost. That is cool stuff. So they had a satellite phone in there making prank phone calls. But, you know, going back to that, you know, Bankin is 50 years old. Hurley's 53. They're, they're just a little younger than me. It just goes to show you, age is, is mindset, man. You know, I'm out there running, doing what I did when I was 30, 20, 40, and enjoying life more. And I feel bad for people who can't do this. I really do. Some people just can't. They have medical conditions. They have limitations. They have, you know, some people are, are in, you know, need assistance. They're in wheelchairs doing whatever. But if you're not, if you're just an able-bodied person and you're just couch potatoing it, I encourage you. I implore you to get out and don't start off thinking, I'm going to run a half marathon. Don't do that. You'll just short circuit yourself. There's programs called Couch to 5K. Couch to 5K is one of the best ones. It gives you a training regimen that doesn't expect a lot from you, and it will get you. You won't be fast. You won't be the fastest person on the block, and don't ever expect to be. When you enter a race, let me back up for a moment. When you enter a race, don't ever expect that you're going to win. You do your best for you. That's how runners think. The only ones that don't think that way are the ones that have a chance. Now, the last uh, half marathon I did, the guy who won it, I think it was from Nigeria, he was pacing at 4 minutes and 30 seconds a mile through 13 miles of running. Okay? That is a dead out, my wife's mad at me, running after me with a frying pan sprint for me. <laughs> but anyways, uh, no matter what age you are, if, if you can move your body, move your body. There are things you can do. You know, I'm, I'm back on this fitness kick. I'm going to get a little preachy with you. Uh, tai Chi. Tai Chi is a great way to get your fluidity back in your body. In fact, that's one of the things I'm thinking, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm going to have to start doing again because it gets, it moves you side to side, back and forth and everything. It gets those hip joints, gets those muscles uh, back to where you're moving in all directions. If you just run, well, then after a while, your muscles are going to start getting to a point where they're building up in the wrong directions and your knees start hurting. You have to have lateral movement all kinds of different movements. Tai Chi is great for that kind of thing. Plus, it's very, very relaxing. And you can do it with all, I mean, even in a wheelchair, you can do Tai Chi for a limited amount, and it gets you moving. Walk, you know, we're getting, I know it's been hot. I know it's been excruciatingly hot, but we're getting to that time of year where mornings are cool. Get up in the morning, get yourself going, and get yourself back into that mindset that I'm going to, you know, put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to start out going a half mile, and then I'm going to go a mile, and then I'm going to go to a mile and a half, and then two, and then two and a half, and next thing you know, you're up to three. It doesn't take long to get to that point. It really does not. If, if you've got that survival mindset and you just force your body to say, I'm not going to quit, there is no quitting. That is my life. For the next month, no quitting, you know. And and like we were yelling, <laughs> no stopping unless you're dying or puking. That's, that's the only way you're going to stop. So, you know, the diet's going to be there. I, I definitely have to drop 5 to 10 pounds in this next month in order to actually get myself into running shape. Um, my running weight, I'm not going to tell you what my running weight is because a lot of you just roll your eyes and go, oh, please, whatever. But <laughs> I'm I'm a skinny boy. I've always been a skinny boy. 
And quite honestly, I packed on some pounds during the first part of this pandemic. I started losing a little bit. But let me tell you what, when you go from running 10 miles a week to running 20 miles a week or more, those pounds start shedding. So I want to get back down to my prime running weight. And hopefully, hopefully, I'll be doing another half marathon in the fall. I found another one. I think it's virtual. I'm not sure. But if, Lord willing, everything gets lifted and we can start actually looking at each other and bringing, breathing each other's air again, um, I'll be doing that. We're already at the bottom of the hour. I'm done talking about running. When we come back, we got all kinds of fun stuff to talk about. Mm, gloom and doom, destruction, all kinds of fun. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Listen now and don't forget, if you go for that solid jive, you can always keep the dream alive. Palin, palin, palin with that. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, Think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810.
Why you should micro or why you should never microwave your tea, according to science. From foodandwine.com, the Brits are self confessed tea addicts. And as such, nearly every British household has something many American homes don't, an electric kettle. My American home has an electric kettle. Of course, some Americans may fire back, well, why do we need an electric kettle when I can heat the mod- water in the microwave? Hey, what kind of argument's this, you savages? Who, who makes tea in the microwave? What is right? Do you make tea in the microwave? That, that's, no. Flipping savages. I'm not British. Okay, my my family lineage, both sides, pretty much is German and American Indian. But I'm not savage enough to make tea in a microwave. Now, in the wintertime, well, actually, in the summertime, I'm an iced tea fanatic. But in the wintertime, you know, I, I drink coffee for, you know, the first hour of the day. And then a lot of times when it's cold out, I switch to hot tea. Never, never, ever, ever. Make hot tea in the microwave. What is wrong with you? It's nasty. Well, I always wondered why you, it tastes different when you do that, but I guess uh, this is the deal. Um, when heating the water from the bottom, like with a kettle or on a stove or, you know, an electric kettle, the warmer water rises, allowing the colder water to fall to the bottom, and this pattern of convection heats the water evenly. Microwaves don't heat by convection. Instead, the heating is what they call volumetric. Um, so what happened was is somebody actually did a published study, science. We probably paid for this with tax dollars, by the way. And this study is called Multiphysics, Analysis for Unusual Heat Convection in Microwave Heating Liquid. Yeah, this is important stuff. It's important stuff. Uh, so they came to a simple conclusion. Microwaves do not hot, uh, heat the water evenly, so you get tea that's kind of nasty. So basically, here's the other way to think of it. You know how when you heat up food in the microwave, you inevitably find that some parts are hotter than others? Well, that happens when you heat water in the microwave, too. After heating a glass of water in the microwave for 90 seconds, researchers found that the water in the top of the glass was about 20 degrees hotter than in the bottom. Now, admittedly, nowhere in the paper did the authors use the word T. That angle was added by the American Institute of Physics, which which published the study. But it's easy to see why a non-uniformly heated cup of water would would not be as good for making tea or any other beverage, for that matter, as evenly heated water would be. Don't be a savage, all right? Have a little dignity. Don't make tea in the microwave, ever. Promise me that. I mean, seriously. Why would you even do that? Why would you think about that? Oh. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. So anyway, um, weather experts are issuing a really bad year for hurricanes. Now, some of you are going to uh, hear this and say, duh, because you just got done getting hit by a hurricane. A lot of people lost power on the East Coast this weekend or last week. Um. It was kind of rough, but it wasn't a a really bad, huge, oh my gosh, it tore everything up hurricane. But this is CBSNews.com. The 2020 Atlantic hurricane season is racking up storms at breakneck speed. Do me a favor, the people who name hurricanes. Okay, can you do me this one solid, okay? Don't name hurricanes something that we can't pronounce. I I don't even know how to pronounce whatever monstrosity hit the East Coast this week. I have no clue how you say that. Now, and I don't watch TV, so I don't, you know, I've never heard anybody say But I've looked at the name, the spelling of the name, and I went, what? What is that? <clears throat> Anyways, today the season is about two weeks ahead of record pace, and it's only one-third of the way through. On Wednesday, the news became more concerning as the research team at Colorado State University, uh, which is the standard bearer for seasonal forecasts, released the most dire forecast in their 37-year history. Labeling 2020 hurricane season extremely active, the team is now predicting 24 named storms, including 12 total hurricanes and five major hurricanes, each figure about double that of a normal season. Uh, Why are we surprised? Why, Why are we even surprised? We've had pandemics. We've had murder hornets. We've had, we've had, what do they find? Russian ants, cannibal ants crawling out of a nuclear facility in Russia? Why not? Hurricanes. Bring them on. We're not afraid anymore. We're not afraid. You know how tough we're going to be when all this blows over? When it's 2021, we're just going to be like a, a bunch of 
war hardened Marines. <laughs> They'd be like, a meteorite's heading straight for the earth. We're all going to be out there going, bring it on. Everybody lights a cigar. Come on, do your worst. We're not afraid. Uh, <laughs> only 21 storm names are allotted each year because the letters Q, U, X, Y, and Z are not used. Why? Why is that? As a result of 24 tropical storms are indeed named, the National Hurricane Center will have to employ the Greek alphabet for overflow. The, come on. The, use Q. Queenie? You can name my Hurricane Queenie. Quentin? Yeah, how about you? Ulysses? Ah, these people are idiots. Anyways, in 2005, when <laughs> this only happened one other time on record in 2005 when the Atlantic experienced 28 storms. So, hang on to your butts. It's going to get crazy. Everything's going nuts. 2020. You know what? If we survive till New Year's Eve 2020, we all should just party like rock stars. I'm sorry. I'm going to call it right now. I am going to be so glad when this year is over. I'm not going to say, we'll look at Apple in 2021. I'm not going to say that because I'm, I'm trying to keep the positive waves going, all right? But anyways, they're saying the most obvious contributing factor to all this is, is uh, basically the water temperatures are being basically near historic levels in the tropical Atlantic, which can act like a high-octane fuel to power hurricanes. Uh, it shows an image where it's just, I mean, the, the Atlantic Ocean is heated up where it matters, and that's feeding and fueling these hurricanes, and it's going to be a rough one, going to be tough. You're going to have to duck and cover, and I'm not just talking about places like Florida and Texas, Pan, you know, the Texas area and Louisiana. These things are going to be coming up the coast. These things are going to be coming up the coast, you know, Georgia, uh, the, the Carolinas, all of those. So be prepared. Don't wait. Don't wait. Do it now. Do it now. You've been warned. The information's out there. Go do it now. Why would you not? Why would you not be out there right now? Just slowly getting yourself ready. It's not easy right now. I do understand that. I do understand that. There are a lot of shortages going on, and it, it just seems to me that there is this hidden panic that's happening. It's it's almost like uh, people are starting to prep, but they're not trying to make a big deal of it, but you do notice it. You go into grocery stores and there's weird things that are missing. There's weird things that they can't keep on the shelf. Do you know this whole uh, the Clorox wipes? The people who make Clorox wipes have come out and said it's going to be the middle of 2021 before you probably see Clorox wipes, wipes on the shelf in your local grocery store again. Isn't that amazing? In the meantime, you're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, bleach. Get you a little bit of bleach, put a couple of tablespoons in uh, in a little thing of water, and, and keep things wiped down. We've done this before. There has not always been Clorox wipes. You can do it. Uh, what else happened? Oh, yeah, the anniversary of the uh, the bombing of, of Hiroshima was this week. Um, not going to get political, not going to go too far into it, but... Do your homework, do your studying. Uh, yes, it was a bad thing, but but it was an option that probably saved millions of lives. It doesn't sound natural to say that, but it's truth. Read your history on that. It's, it's very interesting. There's a few books out there that have some very uh, telling historical facts, not opinions, but they went through and they did. I mean, they researched and researched and researched, and a landing on the mainland, the main Japanese island, uh, landing there with troops probably would have resulted in millions of deaths, if not high into the hundreds of thousands. Not just American troops, not just Japanese troops, Japanese women, children, youth, they were all being conditioned. They were all being told that they will have to fight in the streets, in the country. Every man, woman, and child would have to fight until they were all dead for their mainland, Japan. It would have been a slaughter. 
We already knew just taking over the islands leading up to Japan that there was no surrender for them, that they died willingly. And so even though it was bad, even though there's a lot of debate whether the second uh, atom bomb should have been dropped, and that's not, I'm not even going to get into that. Y'all can just argue until you're dead about that stuff. But the way it went down, the way it happened, looking back on it, probably saved more lives than it killed. I'm just going to leave it at that. Speaking of this, I, I fell down this rabbit hole and I found this little interesting bit of history. Not World War II related, it's World War I related. Did you know that during World War I, Germany tried to entice Mexico into fighting America? Did you know that? You need to remember that um, there was a message decoded by the British who passed it on to the Americans, and it became a justification along with unrestricted submarine warfare for the U.S. declaration of war on Germany in April uh, 1917. It was 100 years ago when Mexico almost invaded the United States. In January of 1917, German Foreign uh, Secretary Arthur Zimmerman dispatched a coded telegram to Heinrich von Eckhart the German ambassador to Mexico. With Germany locked in a bloody stalemate with the Allies in France and Britain's naval blockade strangling the German economy, Kaiser Wilhelm's uh, government was about to make a fateful decision, declare unrestricted submarine warfare, which would allow U-boats to sink merchant ships on site. That also meant sinking the ships of neutral powers, most especially the United States, which would likely respond by declaring war on Germany. But... Zimmerman had instructions for his ambassador. We make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Making war together, making peace together, generous financial support, and understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. This was the famous Zimmerman telegram decoded by the British who passed it on to the Americans, and it became the justification Uh, along with the unrestricted submarine warfare, for the U.S. to declare war on Germany for World War I. Now, this was uh, nationalinterest.org. Now, the Mexican president at the time, uh, Venustiano Carranza, did order his government to study the German proposal. According to Frederick Katz in his book, The Secret War in Mexico, Carranza's uh, decision wasn't surprising. In Mexican eyes, the United States had, in fact, illegally seized one-third of Mexico's territory during the 1847 Mexican-American War, including what are now the states of California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. So they've had a perpetual burr up their backside ever since. In 1916, a U.S. Army Expeditionary Force had entered Mexico in pursuit of the notorious revolutionary Pancho Villa, who had raided American territories. However... When Mexican officials studied the proposal, they concluded that Germany would never be able to ship sufficient munitions, especially given the inevitable American blockade, and that annexing three U.S. states would lead to permanent conflict with America. Ironically, given the current fear over Mexicans' illegal immigrant uh, immigrant status in the United States, the Mexican government worried in 1917 that adding millions of Mexicans to or millions of Americans to Mexico's population would mean the Mexicans couldn't be sure whether we had annexed them or they had annexed us. So they decided not to do it. So what if what if Carranza had decided to ally with Germany? and attack the United States, either to recover the lost territory or to preempt a feared American seizure of Mexican oil. In 1917, the Mexican army numbered perhaps 65,000 to 100,000 soldiers. Well, in 1914, the U.S. Army had just 98,000 men. By the end of 1918, it had swelled to 4 million, of which 2 million had been sent to France. America also had tanks and aircraft provided by the British and French while American industry geared up for war and a huge navy and plenty of money. Short of Kaiser Wilhelm's spiked helmeted legions storming the New York and Baltimore, there was no way Mexico could seize southwestern United States. Yet this didn't matter to Germany. What Mexico could do was tie down American troops and equipment that otherwise would have been sent to Europe, not that many U.S. troops would have been needed to stop a Mexican invasion. 
Though recent history warns that many, many troops would have been needed to occupy Mexico, but a second Mexican-American war could easily have triggered a disproportionate response as the American public demanded that the troops stay home and defend the nation. And this is where history could have changed. The focal point of global events in 1918 was France and Belgium, not Mexico or Texas. Russia, gripped by the Bolshevik Revolution at the time, had pulled out of the war by 1918, leaving Germany free to transfer 50 divisions from the eastern to the western front. In the spring of 1918, the Germans launched a massive offensive in France that nearly won the war. Well, what had helped revive the exhausted British and French armies were the divisions of fresh Yankee troops steaming off the transport ships and into the trenches. If those troops had stayed in America, it is possible that World War I might have ended later than it did, or perhaps even in a compromise peace instead of a German defeat. Fortunately, none of this happened. In the end, Zimmerman Telegram did accomplish something. It hastened Germany's downfall. And we still have Texas and Arizona and New Mexico. Now, that being said, if we would have went to war with Mexico, we probably would have won. And then what? Do we just let them go, or do we just make Texas really, really big? (laughs) That is up for you to decide yourself. Uh, Speaking of um, being old, I was a comic book fan growing up. And when you would buy a comic book, somewhere in the middle or on the back cover, there was always this little cartoon. And it was a cartoon where, you know, you had um, this skinny, scrawny guy with a really hot babe on the beach and some big bodybuilder dude would, like, kick sand in his face and knock him over and basically take his woman and walk away. And the woman would make some kind of snide remark that, you know, well, he's a real man. He's big. You know, he's got muscles. And it was always a a advertisement for Charles Atlas bodybuilding. Was Charles Atlas real? Well, grunge.com says yes and no. The man who would become Charles Atlas was born Angelo Siciliano in 1892, an Italian who had immigrated to New York around the time of his 12th birthday. According to Britannica, he really was a scrawny kid who suffered beatdowns from neighborhood bullies and a real piece of work of an uncle. Not having much money, but wanting to get that leave-me-the-heck-alone body he'd seen displayed at the statues of mythological figures Angelo started exercising using his own zero-cost method called dynamic tension, or muscles pulling against muscles. His friends, so it's claimed, began to refer to him as Atlas, and tacking an Americanized name onto the front of his new moniker made, from an advertising perspective, a new man out of him. Now, how much of this is verifiable remains questionable. The story has all the earmarks of carefully calculated PR campaign. What we do know is Atlas was soon working a Coney Island sideshow gig, winning bodybuilding competitions, and by 1928, running a get-fit company into the ground. That, according to the Smithsonian, is when he turned his fortunes over to Charles Rollman, a 21-year-old ad man, who turned Atlas brand into a household name. In many ways, brought physical fitness to the American public. Now you're a little bit smarter than you were when you first started listening to this podcast today. <laughs> I, you know, and I always was, um, I always was curious to what those, uh, those things entailed. You look at an old comic book and yep, those, those Atlas, Charles Atlas bodybuilding things are still back there. Uh, dynamic tension, you know, workouts. And you, you look at his picture you know, he even now you look at his picture and it's just kind of a compared to the bodybuilders nowadays. Yeah, he had some muscles going on there, but you know, compared to the steroid ridden gym nuts we have nowadays, he wasn't uh, that great. But I guess for 1928, he was pretty cool. But the other thing is, is um, if you're if you if you've got a hot babe, if you got a hot woman, and uh, you get sand kicked in your face, and she runs off with a guy that kicks sand in your face. Eh, go find you another woman. 
work out, yeah, but you know, lift weights get 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 tough, get mean. But yeah, when when you got somebody like that, you're probably better off without her. Just wish them luck. Say, hey, good luck with that one. Go on about your business. So now you know a little bit more about that Charles Atlas ad in the back or the middle of your comic books. How about that? Don't you feel smarter? I'm Alan Ray. What a day it's been. I'm going to leave you with this one. I almost forgot to put this one in. Um, There has been a mystery radio signal sent to Earth from the closest point ever within the Milky Way. Now, this is coming from uh, the New York Post. Scientists have traced mysterious radio signals detected on Earth to a dead star within our own Milky Way galaxy. The millisecond-long burst of radiation was emitted by a magna star, a type of star with an extremely powerful magnetic field, roughly 14,000 light years away. It's practically out our back door. Uh, (laughs) Known as fast radio bursts, or FRBs, Signals such as this uh, have baffled scientists for years and typically originate from far beyond the Milky Way. Their origins are, or origins are unknown. Some think the energetic waves are the result of cosmic explosions, while others have controversially suggested they are signals sent by aliens. I, I like that explanation better. Uh, picked up by radio telescopes worldwide in April, the FRB examined the new study was the first to be detected from inside the Milky Way. Astronomers traced it back to a magna star called SGR 1935 plus 2154. Who names these things? Anyways, potentially settling debate over where FRBs come from. This is the first ever observational connection between the uh, magna stars and fast radio bursts. Astrophysicist Dr. Sandro Marighetti of the National Institute of Aero Astrophysics in Italy said, it's truly a major discovery and it helps us bring the origin of these mysterious phenomena into focus. Fast radio bursts are the intense pulses of radio waves that last no longer than the blink of an eye and produce the energy of a million suns. Craziness. Craziness. And now you're a little bit smarter than you were when you first started listening to this show. I'm Alan Ray. I do this for free. The refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else on KLRN Radio, America's podcast network. Uh, You heard Chick Chat. You heard In the Crease tonight with Jeff. Now you're going to hear Juxtaposition with Rick and Orty. Always. Always interesting, always a good time. They're not like me. I'm all over the place. They pick a subject and hang on it, which is always really kind of cool. You always learn something there. Political Free Friday Nights Rock on KLRN Radio. Stay there. Don't, don't, I mean, just, just like I told you before, earmark, bookmark your uh, KLRN Radio, and any day of the week, you're going to get good programming. Any day. we got great talent. we got great things lined up. Even if you get up in the morning, kick on the Daily Dose with Rick and Stacy, wow, you'll learn all kinds of fun stuff there. And plus, you get in the chat room. You always have to get in that chat room. Uh, the chat room has developed into uh, almost, uh, I don't know. And I was a, I was kind of a, a little bit of a moderator at, at points uh, in a chat room years ago. And it's starting to remind me of the old chat rooms from years ago. We have our own language. We kind of have our own thing going on in there. Get in there, jump in, join it. We'd love to have you. I'm Alan Ray. I'm out of here. Next week, you're going to have a hardcore patriot. Uh, Join me Sunday night at 8 o'clock on KLRN Radio Live for Circumspice, the right side of Michigan. Uh, All things Michigan from a conservative point of view. Even though it's just... Michigan-based, anybody can listen to it. You find out a little bit about the insanity that we call my home state. Love to have you there. Be good to each other. God bless you. God bless America. We'll talk again soon.
tell you like this.